Good morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to everybody. My name is Nancy Lindborg. Uh, I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody here this morning. This is the seventh in a series of USIP uh, bipartisan congressional dialogues, and the series was launched at the beginning of 2018 uh, to provide a platform for members of Congress who are working across the aisle on issues that are critical for our national security and to advance common interests. And this is the bipartisan spirit that, in fact, has been at the heart of USIP since it was founded by Congress in 1984 as an independent, nonpartisan, national institute dedicated to reducing and uh, preventing violent international conflict. And so we believe that that mission, that a world without violent conflict is very possible, that it is, in fact, quite practical, um, and it is essential for our national security. And so we pursue our mission by linking research with policy, with action, on the ground, with partners working in conflict-affected places um, for uh, of lasting peace. And here, we use our global headquarters here to bring people together from across different views, perspectives, um, to tackle difficult problems. Um, and so as an organization, we believe very strongly in fostering bipartisan efforts to strengthen national security. And we have found, despite what you read in the papers, that there are uh, many very thoughtful members of Congress who uh, very much embrace this as a critical way forward. And so we're um, honored that we're able to have with us today two foreign policy experts, leading voices um, and supporters of USIP, Congressman Francis Rooney from Florida and Congressman Don Beyer from Virginia, for a conversation on a critical topic uh, that I think everybody is seized with, soft power in a sharp power world, countering coercion and information warfare. Um, both congressmen have experiences as U.S. ambassadors. They have lived and seen firsthand the effectiveness of soft power and the ability to influence others through attraction and persuasion rather than coercion or force. Um, congressman Rooney served as the U.S. ambassador to the Holy See from 2000 to 2000, sorry, 2005 to 2008, and he's now the vice chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, Congressman Rooney also joined us um, for a previous dialogue in June on Russians, uh, Russia's disruption in Europe, uh, which is an issue very related to the topic this morning. We're delighted to have you back. Thank you for coming back, Congressman Rooney. Um, Congressman Beyer served as the U.S. ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein from 2009 to 2013, and he now serves as the vice ranking member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. I'm delighted to have you join us this morning, Congressman. Um, so today we'll have a chance to really look more deeply at uh, what is sharp power, uh, the ways in which um, uh, information is used in, de in deceptive ways for hostile purposes, um, and uh, have a chance to understand the way in which this disinformation and social disruption are, is enabling countries to spread regional and global influence that contribute to instability and violent global conflict. Um, over the past few years, we have seen countries uh, such as China, Russia, Iran turning more to sharp power as a way to pursue their objectives. And of course, in a world where we have such open and interconnected media systems, these um, tactics are proving more virulent and able to spread more rapidly than ever. I know that USIP has seen this firsthand in the places where we work, a lot of fragile countries around the world that are characterized by very fragmented societies. Um, and it makes these places especially vulnerable, uh, where these tactics can prolong and exacerbate violent conflict. So we'll have an opportunity to discuss this today uh, with our two foremost congressional leaders. And before we begin, I want to invite everyone to follow USIP on Twitter at, at USIP and join in today's conversation using the hashtag BipartisanUSIP. And with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage Congressman Rooney and Congressman Beyer. So, 
Okay. Yeah. And Congressman, did you want to just sure. give us a okay. start? Sure. Yes. Like I said last time, it works a lot better to have notes. Things can go seriously sideways when I don't. Um, first, I'd like to thank Nancy and, and uh, Ambassador Beyer for being here and everyone at the Institute of Peace and the great work that uh, Stephen and all of you are doing. Uh, I thought I might just kind of start with like how we got where we are a little bit. You know, in hindsight, the uh, post-World War II bipolar world brought a level of stability that we didn't necessarily appreciate then, but we can appreciate now. And uh, you know, the autocracy of Russia pursued a sharp power and some soft power uh, agenda. They had these uh, client state skirmishes all over the world. And uh, we had inst international institutions that were put in place to try to counter that and create symmetric relationships among the Western powers and, and reciprocal relationships that would be mutually beneficial. Um, started the, what they, the so-called liberal state, right? And uh, of course, the United States developed its own soft power tools. We Radio Free Europe, Voice of America, uh, the department, uh, the department, and Eisenhower Foundation exchange programs. We've all known many people that have come from around the world through those programs and become familiar with our country. And we have many of our people that have become familiar with other countries. It creates that symmetrical bond. And of course, AID. Um, notice General Mattis' comment recently during the first budget d discussion, which basically took AID off the table, that if you don't do the AID money, I need more tanks. Um, might contrast our deployment of soft power in the bi bipolar world with uh, the, the Russia uh, view of sharp power, conversion and, uh, co uh, coercion and intimidation, you know, uh, Eastern Europe, the surveillance in every building. Uh, client state cultivation, money, force. Uh, I saw it in Latin America and Asia. And it comes down to the fact that the autocracies have to display force since they don't have citizens' rights and they can't take care of their people like we take care of our people. They have to do it through repression. So came the end of the Cold War, the end of history, right? Remember that? Um, U.S. soft power and, and economic engine blew them away. Freedom won for a while. And it created the unipolar world. And now what do we have? We're back to a multipolar world. And to me, opinion, it's quite chaotic. We're seeing these tectonic movements as realignments take place and new hegemonic ambitions come up. You know, Condi used to say when, when, we, uh, when I was still involved with things in 2009 that uh, uh, the realignments that ensued from the Cold War are not done yet. They're still evolving. And I think we're seeing that kind of every day to one extent or another, which makes the USIP's work very important to complement AID and the State Department and the more hard power people. Um, you know, China and the WTO, there's a great article recently about did the U.S. get it wrong, okay? When, we, when they joined the WTO, the whole game changed with China, perhaps in some good ways, perhaps in some bad ways. I don't think we really know. We could use a bit of the Chinese sense of history, long-term perspective on that, still unfolding. But clearly, it's put a lot of strains, and we're seeing a lot of it right now. Um, in the international organizations, it seems to me, became less less powerful and more impotent. You know, the the abuses of the UN Human Rights Commission and the International Criminal Court, those didn't have to get that out of hand with a little more leadership. Um, and now we have aggression by these newly empowered uh, hegemons, you know. We've got Iran and North Korea with their nukes. Uh, no one seemed to be able to deal, deal with North Korea. I think they, they've defied Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now they're defying Trump. Um, we've got Russia and Crimea. I, uh, I just, and in the Ukraine, this is, uh, got worse even today in the Wall Street Journal, the article about the Sea of Azov, you know. They're trying to stranglehold uh, the eastern, uh, uh, eastern um, Ukraine. Um, it reminds me of Robert Kagan's great book, The Return of History. I don't know if anybody's read that, but it's coming before us every day. Uh, and so the return of sharp power, sharp power and the autocrats has also uh, complemented this, you know, the coercion that we're seeing uh, and su subornation that we're seeing with China and Southeast Asia with the Belt and Road, and we see in Africa and Latin America by huge infrastructure projects, uh, finance with yuan, and hard to be paid for. You know, I think we've seen some of that in Slovakia or Slovenia just recently. Um, we have these proxy campaigns going on. You know, Iran's in Yemen, Iran's in Iraq and Syria. Iran's basically owns the eastern half of Iraq now. We could probably debate a long time 
whether it was right that we got them in that position to be able to do that. Um, I have my own opinions about that. Uh, and then we have this new disinformation campaign. I don't know how much China's involved in that, but we know the Russia stuff's been in the paper a lot. And the uh, influencing both Eastern, influencing both Europe and the United States, leveraging those technologies that Nancy mentioned is, presents, a new, presents a new kind of danger to us. And I think we need to deal responsibly with that. And even when they get into elections, imagine that. Uh, so what can we do now to counter with soft power of our democracies, you know? We have to appeal to our values and culture the old way, the hard way, the refocus on our symmetrical alignments, reciprocal alignments that allow everybody to win and build trade relationships. Uh, I have personal experience with the Holy See's soft power, you know, both with uh, dealing with the reinterpretation of Islamic theology to come into context with the modern world, both in the, in the, in the work that the, that the Holy See did with Iran, since they could talk to Iran in 2005 through 2009 and we could not. Um, and then the mediation roles they've done. I mean, you may disagree with what happened with Cuba, but you can't disagree with the unique role the Holy See could play as a soft power arbiter under the radar screen where nobody wants to take credit for what they're doing. And that I could cite many instances of, of similar mediations and, and, and interjections with the Holy See, most of which are quiet because they don't need to take credit for what they do. And I think the soft power works really well when you don't have to take credit for what you do. It keeps it soft. Um, other soft power institutions, of course, is the new U.S. Agency for Global Media. I'm real excited about combining those things, repackaging them. Um, the Farsi broadcast into Iran have over 17 percent market share. You know, one of the things I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do with soft power is show the Iranian people that when the time comes that they're ready for us, we're ready for them, the same way that the Warsaw Pact countries knew that we were ready for them when the time came that we could approach them and vice versa. And I think that's incumbent on us, and I think that the Global Media Center is a real uh, opportunity to do that. Um, Agency for International, the, 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 the other thing is, uh, to me, this may be at variance with some current things, but I think multilateral trade agreements are very important. And fortunately, we, NAFTA has survived in some slight, maybe improvement, I don't know, but it survived. Uh, TPP has not, but there's a little bit of nascent discussion in the White House that maybe they need to revisit that too. Every chance I get, I talk about the security aspects of multilateral trade agreements. And I've even made the comment to some of the people in the White House, do you know about CETO? You know? TPP has got a little bit of CETO in it, if we could just get it done. And then now we have TTIP's dead, and in Latin America we have the rise of the Pacific Alliance. So are we going to sit here and let the, Latin, the good, profitable Latin American countries develop their own relationships with Asia, or are we going to get on that <coughs> bus as well? So we've got some real challenges there. And then the last thing is, you know, these exchange programs and the threats to USAID are troublesome, because the more people that get to know the unit, if, if we believe we're the best, then the more people that aren't from the United States that we get to experience us, you would think would be the better for our country in the long run. And so I hope that we can get back to what we used to do, like what the department did and the Eisenhower Institute and things like that. And um, we need to refocus on our Cold War allies. They're still the strongest allies we have. We share the cultural heritage, uh, immigration heritage, fought two wars with them, maybe more. That's the two I remember. Uh, I guess you could say that the first global war, the, the French and Indian War, was one, too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and it's the, the only ones that we can really leverage those common ties with. So hopefully we're going to be able to do all that and get, get back in focus before things um, continue to, um, I don't want to be negative about it, but before, before things would continue to, to uh, devolve, as I think they're doing right now. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, very much. Good morning. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, Nancy Lindbergh, thank you and your staff for putting this together. Thank you for Francis for inviting me, for thinking of me. Um, my wife is on the board uh, of the International Advisory Council here at USIP, um, so she told me I had to come. Uh, and I was thrilled to be here with Francis. You know, we are both Jesuit educated here in Washington. I went to Gonzaga, he went to Georgetown Prep. 
uh, source of all Supreme Court justices. Um, and uh, I didn't get into Georgetown Prep, which is why I went to Gonzaga. And uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're two of the few business people in Congress. Um, you think that Congress is being mostly business and lawyers. It's actually mostly former staff people uh, who succeed their bosses. And when we were both uh, ambassadors, um, the Holy See and Switzerland, which have an incredible overlaps. For example, the, Switzerland has the Swiss Guard that protected Francis all those years. Um, I also represent the Liechtenstein, where the Crown Prince Hans Adam is very close to all the popes. The Pope baptizes all the children in Liechtenstein, and it's a 100% Catholic country. But most importantly, the only two countries that have square flags. Uh, the Vatican and the, and the Swiss. So, um, and I want to apologize for leaving a little early. We're having um, our Democratic votes for speaker at 10 o'clock, and uh, I'm not allowed to miss it. Um, I, I want to take a, a slightly different tack than, than Ambassador Rooney. Because political and technological changes, democracies are really perhaps more vulnerable than they've ever been to disinformation. Um, because of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, the, just smartphones alone, where you're bombarded day in and day out. And so the tactics of disinformation, subversion, intimidation, uh, internal meddling, not just in elections, but in, in how we actually understand the news on a day-to-day -day basis, are, are far more prevalent than they've ever been before. And they've actually become absolutely central to the practice of foreign affairs and these resurgent autocracies. And technology gives these governments the ability to cost-effectively reach into cell phones, reach into living rooms around the world and sear, sow fear, doubt, division, undermine alliances, spread the fake news. Um, I get an email a week from my aunt and godmother out in St. Louis. Um, her favorite one is the one about all the advantages that members of Congress have. We get our own free health insurance. The first day we serve, we get our salary for life. Um, none of our children, all of our, their colleges are paid for, et cetera. There's 22 of these. 22 of them are wrong. Um, but someone has sent this to her, and she believes it, and she's very upset by it. Um, the original academic analysis of sharp power focused on Russia and China, and those countries certainly are the world's foremost purveyors of, of sharp power, but not just them. It's virtually every country. In fact, no self-respecting dictator is without a paid legion of keyboard warriors on Twitter or Weibo or Vcontacta, along with the pseudo-journalists and the hackers and other agents of sharp power, uh, including the couch potatoes that are in the parents' basement in some Eastern European country. It's no accident that uh, Saad Al-Qahtani, the man chosen to orchestrate the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, was primarily an information warrior. And this speaks to the centrality of an information warrior to the security and the diplomatic toolkits of autocracies. Traditionally, the unmatched soft power of the United States, so many of the things that Francis talked about, our culture and our ideas have made us and our allies very resistant to the tools of sharp power. But just as our vulnerability to all the new technology of soft power, sharp power has increased, <clears throat> as we struggle even to ascertain the level of Russian meddling in our last elections, our soft power is at a low ebb. Anecdotally, foreigners I speak to don't know whether to fear a newly erratic United States to laugh at us or to cry for us. More scientifically, Pew research around the globe shows a sharp and continued decline in the perceptions of the United States and of our government around the world, but particularly among the people of many of our traditional allies in Western Europe and Canada and, of course, Mexico. It's ironic that only in Russia, Israel, and, curiously, Kenya are we more popular than we were two years ago. And so when, when people don't respect the United States, it weakens and it empties out our, our soft power. And this is, of course, compounded by the hollowing out of the formal tools of our soft power, our diplomatic corps and, and USAID. Um, I know, Francis, and I, we, we and often bemoan that there are more members of military bands than there are U.S. Foreign Service officers. There are more accountants in the Pentagon than there are U.S. Foreign Service officers. You've all heard the refrain, America first means America alone. Up to this point, in some ways, we've witnessed the enduring centrality of the United States to the global democratic system, NATO, EU, United Nations, and, and so forth. 
But leaders so far have been willing to grant us leeway and endure withering insults or misguided tariffs or withdrawing from bilateral trade agreements in the hope that one day America soon will be America again. But as we alienate the populace of the, those democracies, I fear the domestic political logic for those leaders is going to change. They have already started looking for alternatives, as Francis pointed out. The thought that with our withdrawal from TPP, we will let China write the rules for trade in, in the Pacific for a generation. But the erosion isn't complete. The American soft power relies on three components, our cultural exports, our economic preeminence, and the power of the American ideal, you know, the shining city on the hill. And to maintain that power, it's critically that we maintain all three of these. We cannot remain a beacon if we don't live up to these ideals, if we ourselves do not take a vision of the world founded on democracy and human rights seriously. I know we will be working together with many members of Congress across party lines on the murder of Khashoggi uh, and, and our failure at the moment to live up to our American ideals. Some degree of power capability, our own sharp power, is always going to be necessary to counter our rivals. But we have to rely on the soft power that's unique to the United States. And to do that, we cannot allow it to wither away. Thanks. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. I mean, this is, this is an important conversation at a time where there are uh, many people reflecting here in this town and, and, and globally on, you know, uh, what are the stresses and strains on the international liberal world order, which, of course, we've been a primary upholder of uh, for the last 70 years. You both, um, <clears throat> and I was struck uh, by the fact that not only were you both ambassadors, you were both ambassadors in places that are themselves beacons of soft power. You mentioned your experiences uh, to the Holy S as ambassador to the Holy See, to, to Switzerland. Um, I, let's start by, you know, we have smart power, hard power, soft power, and now sharp power, especially from your experiences as ambassadors in the kinds of places that you were. Say a little bit more about what is specific to soft power that you saw or experienced that was so particularly effective. Well, I mean, first of all, <clears throat> there are places like Switzerland and the Holy See that offer real opportunity because of their lack of hege hegemonic aggression. Historically, they're not as big a threat. And I saw it with the Holy See with Ahmadinejad when he was saying a lot of horrible things. The uh, White House and the State Department would, would get me to go talk to the, the Secretary of State of the Holy See about what we would like to see the Pope say. And the Pope would say all this stuff. And, you know, when George Bush would say it or something or uh, anybody else, they, they would, uh, they, he would criticize them as just wanting to get your hands on our oil or something. Well, he couldn't say anything about the Pope doing it. And the Pope attacked Ahmadinejad for the world for four, three or four straight years. You know, the, the, the mediating role in de-intensifying conflicts is an element of soft power, which I know the U.S. Institute of Peace is really expert at. And uh, we, so we've seen that with the Holy See many times where they've intervened. They intervened between Chile and Peru one time. They've intervened all over Central America. Chavez asked them to intervene in Venezuela, and they were smart enough to realize that they couldn't accomplish anything, so they said no. And then the last thing was this Cuba deal, which I thought was fascinating that you can conduct a multi-site negotiation between host two hostile countries uh, over two years and not one word got out. Very few mediators could accomplish that. And how about Switzerland, which is another well, uh, place uh, of neutrality? There are a variety of different power. takes. Let me take my favorite, which is when, uh, before I went over, I, I sat with the assistant secretary and said, what's, what's our goal? What's our mission? They said to overcome the anti-American sentiment in Switzerland. And this is based on the two wars and Abu Ghraib and death penalties and environmental stuff. And, uh, and after Meg and I had been there for about six months, we realized the heart of anti-American sentiment was the American expat community um, <laughs> that was upset about FATCA and FUBAR and all those other things. Um, so we ended up... Um, getting deeply involved in the Swiss culture with, with her own take on it. So hiking and climbing and skiing and going to all the cantons and meeting all the mayors was incredibly helpful in terms of restoring that relationship. One of my favorite little anecdotes, we were climbing um, a mountain near Grindelwald, 
with the guide, and we got about halfway up the mountain, some Swiss were coming down, and they said, oh my God, we've never seen Americans this high on a mountain before. <laughs> <laughs> and and at right. the end, you know, I, I was, could, we were talking about running for election there, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but then from the real soft power, when the U.S. wanted Russia to join the WTO uh, with the, the so far vain hope that it would move them away from an extraction economy, move them into modern economies, and help democratize, um, Georgia had veto power. Um, over it, and we went to the Swiss to say, partner with us, your great negotiators, to get Georgia to, to come on board. On Iran sanctions, Switzerland was the hole in the donut for buying oil, uh, doing banking, and buying centrifuges for Iran, and because so, and, they're not part of the, of the EU nor NATO. And so it was soft, U.S. soft power again and again that eventually got them to close down all of those Things, so that by the end, they couldn't cast their, their checks. And, and the Swiss are coming saying, please give us a little slack so we can pay the Iranian diplomats in Geneva. Um, but that was all soft power that did that. So, so what do you think accounts for the rise of what we are now calling sharp power? I mean, why is this suddenly like a tsunami wave bearing down on us? Well, I, I and say a little bit about how you define sharp power. Well, I think sharp power is all these things that are not military but are not soft, you know, whether it's surveillance, co-option, co subordination, uh, uh, minor forms of physical intimidation or mental intimidation, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that would not constitute military conflict and don't constitute soft power. And, and you know, I think that you go back to this whole chaotic hegemonic evolution in the post-unipolar or bipolar world is unleashing a lot of new uh, hegemonic ambitions and, and efforts combined with, as you mentioned, about technology. That's kind of gives them the weapons to use to do it. Yeah. I would, I'd say sort of three factors, and, and to repeat what Francis has said, number one is the, the, the all-powerful U.S. military. And I know Russia still has some nuclear weapons, but they're um, beyond nuclear, they're, they're not a factor to deal with at all with us. China is rising, but it's still a small, small fraction of what we have. So if they want to compete, they can't compete on a military basis, on a hard power basis. So it pushes them to soft power. Meg and I have been to Aspen Institute um, week-long seminar the last two years on Russia. And the one thing that comes out of it is how incredibly insecure Russia is mm -hmm. and how much they, they used to be a world power and now the, you know, the population is shrinking and they have enormous problems. Um, with Putin especially, this desire to fight back and to be recognized as a world player again. And without, uh, you know, in the Cold War, we had the military against military here. It's unipolar, so they have to do sharp power. And China, on the other hand, is just a completely different beast. I mean, the, the rate of economic growth there is so strong, their ability to invest in so many different things. And once again, uh, if you, you go back 3,000 years, there's these, this sense of uh, Chinese exceptionalism, you know, that they should be leading the world. And this, again, is one of the tools to help them do that. Yeah, remember Zing He came back from his ex exploration, told the uh, the ruler of China, "There's nothing to learn from those guys. Forget it." <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, even the terminology "sharp" versus "soft power" suggests that the sharp power will reign. You know, that it can pierce the soft power tools. Um, how, how do you see when when you think about going up against sharp power with soft power? And this conversation used to happen vis-a-vis -vis hard power, of course, which is why we came up with smart power. But how, how do you what, what's the how can the soft power tools and approaches prevail in well, the face of sharp? As diplomats and and uh, uh, business people, me and the ambassador here, have to be optimistic about the future. We can't be too pessimistic. That's just by nature. And so we've got to hope that the value-driven city on the hill that, that uh, Congressman Ambassador Breyer mentioned will ultimately win out over these nefarious autocratic uh, influences that don't provide for their people where we've proven that we can. And so as we face these widening tools that create more opportunities for them to create mayhem, we have to be even more vigilant in propagating our, the shared values and culture and the things that, that bring us together with the, with the world, especially our former allies. Yeah. 
I, I heartily agree. You know, I think we're, we're both enlightenment candidates and believe in the enlightenment, you know, which means that, that in the short run, um, you're going to get hurt by the people that don't play by the rules. But, but by playing by the rules, by lifting the ideals up, we always win in the long run. And both of us see it in business. I'm sure, you know, our, our number one principle in business is integrity, which means you often get outbid or screwed by the person that doesn't play with integrity. But ultimately, ultimately we win. Almost always we win. And the other principle thing in business is it's got to be a win-win deal to be enduring. And most of our great foreign policy victories have been bipartisan, enduring victories that could sustain, whether it's containment or whatever. And and uh, that's not always the case in partisan politics. <laughs> so we're we're going to be working on that win-win in the next two years. You bet. Yeah. Looking forward to it. You heard it here. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and we start with climate change. So. Yeah. 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 We, the climate change another... bill, the carbon tax bill was introduced last night. It's been yeah, yeah. Congressman's main project, and I think I'm the one of two Republicans on it. Yeah, yeah. Two of many to come. Yeah. You got it. You also have flak jackets around here. <laughs> Can I borrow a flak jacket when I go back to? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, have, I have to go campaign for Francis in Florida now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Congressman, you talked a little bit about some of the soft power tools in your remarks that we developed during the Cold War. Are those still the right tools? Do we need to bolster them? Are they, you know, how do, do they need to evolve? Um, how, how are we doing on our soft power toolbox? Well, that's a good question. You know, without getting too far off message here, I think we need to make sure that the free press and the First Amendment that have made our country so important and given us the, the democracy can't die in darkness, so to speak, of the Washington Post, uh, are adapted to Facebook and Google. And I feel real, I have real problems with what we've seen out of Facebook and Google lately. And I don't think our legal and constitutional regimens have come to terms with them. And I'd add to that that, and I think we've seen enormous evolution and awareness since 2016 with the Russian interference, but the education of the American people, starting in first grade, to be suspicious and skeptical of everything you read, to test everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, not just my, my crazy aunt in St. Louis, um, but we see it from the left, too, where... Um, you know, things that are blown out of sh my, my daughter will often come to us and say, can you believe this? Honey, let's, let's, let's check that. Um, and, and across the world, across, across the democratic world, is to build a, a, the kind of skepticism that goes with the free press. You know, that's a fascinating point. When you think about the, the Slavic paranoia that's written about so much uh, that you alluded to about Russia makes it easy for an autocrat to manipulate their people, whereas we have been insulated from that manipulation because of our lack of paranoia. Yeah. That's a really good point. Congressman, we're in the last few minutes before, you, you, and you are excused for this important vote. Yeah, vote. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, thank yeah. you for making the time to join us despite that time crunch. But before you leave, a final question and any final thoughts you want to add. But that is, you know, do we need to compromise our commitment to open society that has really characterized, you know, who we are as a as a <coughs> as a people in the face of these sharp power attacks? That's that's a hard question and an easy answer. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in fact, when we go back through our history, when we did compromise, you know, the Alien Sedition Act or or the internment of the Japanese or any of those times, we're always retrospectively embarrassed that we compromise our values for our short-term security. So I think, I think we need to double down on America as, uh, and, and live up to our ideals. We know, we clearly will agree on what our ideals are. We just need to live up to them in every possible way. Thank you for Thank joining us. Thank you very us. much. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Thanks, Francis. Yeah, the best See you way later. You win, okay? All right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Congressman, we thank you for staying with us. And I, I'd so like to you give you a crack. You all can leave if you want. You're stuck with me, okay? <laughs> it's hard uh, to act to follow Congressman Meyer, let me assure you. Um, I, I, I'd love to give you a crack at that question, because I think it's one of the fundamental issues, is how do we, you know, should we uh, compromise our open society commitments in the face of all of the sharp power attacks that we're facing? No, I, I would agree with uh, Congressman Meyer. We actually have to double down. We have to figure out how to deal with the new threats that come from technology and, and some of the adverse consequences of globalization that have created some bad trends in our society now that are being manipulated by politicians and figure out how to remain true to the values that make America what it is. And it's, 
I mean, when you've got the president of France sounding more American values than us, I'm, we've got a real problem here. We have to get back to what makes the United States the United States. And do you see that the United States has to, you know, get down into the mud and wrestle with some of the same tools and tactics? I mean, how do we draw a line against the onslaught of what we see? Well, you know, statecraft is kind of a messy business at times, and we're no angels. And you need to combine all the tools of statecraft to win the game. But that doesn't mean they're in the derogation of our fundamental principles that drive our country. You know, you could make the argument that a, uh, a Russian cyber hack is just a leaflet drop of today with current technology. So I think what we have to make sure is that we know what's happening. Mm -hmm. We have to invest in intelligence. We have to know what they can do to us. And, and that doesn't mean we have to do the same to them. But there are times when we have to deploy intelligence tools. Um, uh, certainly, we, we have to have our military. Oh, the more you have, the less you have to use it. It's always been my kind of feeling about the military. Uh, we've got a real problem in Asia right now with pulling back and not living up to American values. So the head of the Philippines goes and cuts a deal with China because he can't trust us. You know, a lot of things that we, we need to deal with. So a final question, then we're going to open it up for, que for audience questions, and that is, um, you know, we've seen enormous amounts of Chinese investment going into an arc of fragile states, you know, across Asia um, and Africa. Uh, we can't compete with that kind of investment. Do you see uh, soft power as a way to in continue engagement with those countries, or how do you think the U.S. should respond? to that kind of, I don't know what you well, would call that, <clears throat> money power. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's certainly uh, sort of a question of who's going to run out of money first. You know, Margaret Thatcher used to say, the problem with socialism is you run out of spending everybody else's money. Mm -hmm. And both China and the United States are spending gobs of money around the world to accomplish different objectives. And uh, a lot of our money is being spent right here to accomplish more social objectives while they're trying to pursue their mercantilist policy. And, uh, you know, I think that we need to uh, do things like the BUILD Act that we just passed that I think is a step in the right direction to bring elements of OPEC, XM Bank, AID together to be more effective in combating China. You know, you go back to why AEID was ramped up or the XM Bank was put together years ago was to combat MITI, the, Jap the original Japanese business promotion thing back in the 80s. And so, you know, that, that's one positive step that we can, we can look to. Great. So uh, um, we have mics uh, for those who have questions. And I'm going to, um, here, let's stage the mic with the gentleman in the second row. And while you're going there, I'm going to start with a first question that we received from a young student in Florida who hmm. is watching online. And the question is Are they 18? Uh, Can they vote? Uh, <laughs> yes, they are in college good. Uh, at Nova Southeastern University. Oh, good, good. And the question is, how do you better prepare young people to address these challenges? Well, I think civics would be a good start. I read a lot that there's not enough civics taught in grade school and high school. And I think we need to make sure that the commitment United States, if you will, values that we've been talking about it bleeds down into what the kids learn in school. They need to know our history. One thing I admire China for is their uh, orientation towards history, you know, because we're doomed to repeat it if we don't understand it. And so a lot of things that we could do to give our students now more of a historical grounding in the world and in the history of the United States and why we are us. Why did they write the Declaration of Independence? What were they fleeing? Those kinds of things would help. That's what the musical Hamilton is for, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sir. Yes, thank you, Congress. I think you're on. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Congressman, very much for your uh, presentation today. Um, I had to, a quick comment. Do you want to quick... just introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Anthony Vance. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Baha'is of the United States. Mm. Um, our problems, of course, uh, that work that bring us to today's session are primarily in Iran, where not only are Baha'is persecuted, but there is a tremendous campaign of uh, hate speech that uh, takes place in the state-controlled media. And some of that makes it into Google. Um, that is the Persian version of, of Google. Um, 
you'd, I'm sure you'd be very interested to know that the State Department is, uh, has just received and has accepted for consideration a proposal from an entity, I, I don't want to identify the, the company right here, but it's, it is working with us in terms of creating algorithms that can remove certain forms of hate speech from, uh, from websites uh, or reduce their, um, their position in the hierarchy of, uh, of uh, searches. Um, we'll see if that proposal you know, is actually approved, but I think it's a, a really kind of cutting edge thing, the kind of thing that you and Congressman Beyer were talking about this morning. Now, the question that I'd like to ask, however, is a much more mundane, simple one, and that has to do with House Resolution 274, which is before uh, your, the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee. It condemns the persecution of the Baha'is of Iran and also other human rights abuses. Outgoing Chairman Ed Royce uh, supported it uh, two mm -hmm. years ago, a similar resolution. We're hoping he can get, get it uh, through committee and, and through some sort of expedited procedure. It doesn't need hearings. It doesn't need Most more. of those are yeah. unanimous consent. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just the passage of a resolution. This has to do with this whole idea of— I'm going to get, ask you okay. to get to your question. Oh, yeah. The question, would be, <laughs> the question would be, could you urge uh, Chairman Royce to— uh, to to get this passed, uh, to to get it through the process in the in the uh, Congress. I'll, I'll look into it, but I doubt you're going to have any trouble with uh, Elliot Engels pursuing it in January either. So yeah, I think you're going to be in pretty good shape on That's that. right, but we'd have to start all over again yeah. then. Right now, it's got over 130 I might also mention your comment about the effort in Iran to deal with hate speech gets back to that whole idea of policing Google and Facebook. Yeah. You know, I think if we could get apply the First Amendment. It would, it would, and get other countries to do the same, to separate out libel and non-protected speech from protected speech, would lay a groundwork to maybe deal with them on both sides of the equation. Mm. Not having the hate speech, having the freedom to yeah. present all points of view. Yeah. I mean, this is this is one of the big conundrums of how to, uh, and a big challenge uh, that may be coming before Congress in the coming years of how to deal with these social media platforms. Well, like I say, I don't think the regulatory schemes and legal schemes are up to date to deal with these changes. I mean, it's like having uh, laws dealing with horse and buggies when the automobile began, and and uh, uh, the Europeans have actually been more forward leading than us with their antitrust pursuit of Google. We've just been sitting around like I've been saying to these guys like the chairmen of the committees that deal with the judiciary, why aren't we doing that? Why don't we get the Justice Department to look into their abusive market power? Amazon, Google, and Facebook are the Standard Oil and uh, uh, Carnegie Steel Trust of today. Do you, do you foresee Congress taking that up in the next well, several years? Well, I haven't seen anybody do it yet. Maybe we'll get a change. I don't know. Right now, we're following Europe's lead. Interesting, too. Uh, right here in the front row. You can just pass it forward. Hi, thank you, Congressman, reporter with Voice of America. So uh, you mentioned the importance of business, and also the U.S. has been in a trade dispute with China for a while. So do you have any expectations in terms of the incoming meeting between Trump and President Xi? Do you think they can reach a deal? If so, what kind of deal should be like? And especially you bring up a bill, a bill to stop uh, higher education espionage. Do you think mm -hmm. that should be considered as part of the deal? Thank you. Well, I, I think that the, the issue of the Confucius Center is something that American people don't know about. And I think there's uh, probably differences of opinion from what us and our intelligence community might feel and maybe people in the Chinese government that we need to, uh, we need to make sure the American people understand what's going on with Confucius centers, at least from our point of view, entrusted with the job of protecting the American people. Uh, as far as the trade deal, I, I think that I think that uh, some of the articles have been written about China uh, post WTO uh, have have some truth to them that maybe China hadn't played by the rules as often as other countries. Obviously, Russia has a habit of not playing by the rules either. That's a problem with authoritarian regimes. They don't have to play by the rules. They just do what they want. We have people like me and Congressman Beyer and the free press beating on them all the time if they don't. And so uh, there's room for some correction. An IP threat, theft and things like that. Uh, I'm disheartened that Google is willing to cave to China on this uh, China-only Google website. 
I was disappointed that Delta Airlines and Marriott uh, caved just because they had a map of Taiwan on their graphics. I mean, so what? I mean, Taiwan ain't going anywhere. I mean, the, the, if China wanted Taiwan, they'd go get it. You know, uh, I think there's opportunities for China, for Taiwan to continue to evolve, and the conflict between the two sovereigns will de descend to the point that one is automatically submerged into the other. And that's, by the way, always been the view of the Holy See, that ultimately uh, the, the Catholic Church has the best opportunity in China, not outside of China. And you can see that in what the Pope's doing now. So I'm going to take a couple of questions to make sure we get to them. So you, sure. sir, and then over there. Yeah. Hi, uh, Congressman. Thanks for your time. Uh, my name is David Cofield with Kyle House Group here in Washington, D.C. Um, there's some reports that the administration may be conducting a foreign assistance review um, with or without consultation with Congress and stakeholders. Are you aware of it? Um, and are there uh, opportunities uh, to be engaged in that process? I'm not. It wouldn't be the first time the executive branch has uh, decided to do some things without keeping Congress informed, which is a two-way street. David Halberstram, in either, 90, either 71 or 72, wrote a book called The Imperial Presidency. I mean, that was 71 and 72 about things like the Cold War and revenue sharing. Can you imagine what we've got up there now? And so, uh, you know, that's why we all fought back so hard on the initial 2017 budget for the State Department and AID, and, and we'll be ready to fight back right now. Um, um, Emmanuel Achenkora, uh, Tri Peace International. Um, well, the major concern I want to um, present for everyone to um, kind of um, take a look at is. Um, the very concern that for the fact that there is a thing known as um, great power competition, um, how possible is it actually for um, a government to um, be on the front line of um, um, trying to promote soft power, uh, uh, soft power, soft power? Um, well, my organization is uh, we have um, uh, a strategy um, on. Uh, crowdsourcing of solutions to global peace. Uh, we believe that that is um, probably a, a, a more feasible um, um, angle to approach uh, soft power um, because then it is the people that have to really pursue soft power and bring it to the fore rather than the government standing on the front line. So, so the question is, the, how, how can governments pursue sure, soft power sure. versus people power soft power? Well, I think you make an interesting point that has analogy to the Holy See, that the reason that the people may be more effective than government is the, the people don't have a hegemonic agenda like the Holy See or Switzerland does. But on the other hand, at the end of the day, soft power is based on influence versus coercion, which means it's got to be based on some moral righteousness higher than whatever dispute and in the mud is going on. And so as long as the soft power is based on values, culture, and principle, probably there's room for everybody to do it. States, people, uh, non-aligned uh, NGOs, whoever. U.S. Institute of Peace. Thank you. Uh, do we have other questions? I thought I saw another hand a minute ago that I skipped over. No? no. Yeah? No? Oh, Amr? Hattie? Hey, Congressman. Um, Hattie Ammer from the Brookings Institution. So oh, yeah. I, I've got a question for you. That's where Robert Kagan is, isn't he? That's yeah, right. He's uh, office is directly next to mine, in fact. Yeah, tell, it's a great book. That um, book of his it outlines a lot of the things that we've been talking about here. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I agree. So here's a question for you. Um, you know, having uh, uh, wished my, my Congressman Don Byer was still here, but, but actually really interested in your answer. As I talk to uh, uh, European and Asian uh, uh, Middle Eastern diplomats, um, you know, I, I get this question from them, which is, can you please explain to me why the administration did X, Y, or Z? And, uh, and they've, they've kind of stopped asking me that recently. And when I ask them, they, they've, they've sort of come to a conclusion, I think, which is uh, based on the following. You know, our, 
our leadership in the world, as, as you and Don have alluded to, is based on our military strength, based on our economic strength, and based on our ideals. But I think with the diplomatic community, it was also based on the following uh, a dimension of, of who we are, which is that they believed, whether they agreed or disagreed with our policy decisions, that they were based on a broad and deep analysis that, that took place in a process led by the White House um, uh, that, you know, they consulted across the agencies, there were deputies committees meetings, IPCs, you know, and, and decisions were taken. They, they now, the, the ones that I talk to have, are now sort of disregarding it, the decisions I think that we're taking or, or feeling that they're not based on deep analysis. And so I, I would posit, first of all, that that is another sort of Amer American strength, the belief that we have done rigorous analysis in our foreign policy decisions. And so um, uh, I guess my question is, what can um, really wise members of Congress like yourself and Don uh, do uh, together with a think tank community to try to instill a belief that that America, uh, w you know, can and will do this deep uh, foreign policy analysis that they are willing to follow, whether they initially agree with it or not. Sorry if I've been a little bit. No, I think you make question. a really good point. I mean, like I said before, I have the utmost respect for the uh, intelligence community of the United States and, and the Department of State and the work that they've done. There's a lot of smart people over in that building over there. I've learned an awful lot from them. And, and the ability to, uh, to figure out containment, George Kennan, the ability to figure out how to deal with the decline of the Palestine mandate. That smart guys figured that out. They had a leadership in the executive branch that was willing to back them up and work with them. We, I just read a great book, Lords of the Desert. Has anybody read that? It's about the, the kind of soft power under the table conflict between the United States and the UK over the evisceration of the Palestine mandate, the uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran finally realizing what their petroleum was worth and wanting the right kind of deal that they deserve, quite frankly. United States being, okay, we're going to give Saudi Arabia half. Pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. The UK declining power, thinking they should be taken seriously, Churchill, Okay, no, those Iranians get five or ten percent. Well, look what happened. They nationalized Anglo-American, Anglo-Iranian, uh, uh, and we're here with the Ramco today. And so there's a lot of great lessons in there that point to, to your kind of question. Uh, George, last question. Ambassador Moose. So, uh, yeah. George Moose from the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, yeah. Board. Uh, since we're talking about books, there's another new book that's out there, uh, Peter Singer's book called Like War, which goes that. back and traces um, the evolution of the use of, of uh, social media and the related technologies. One of the observations from his book is that, and one of the, one of the things that constrains us so much is we have been so compartmentalized uh, institutionally our, in our uh, responses to uh, these challenges of sharp power. Uh, which seems to suggest that there's a, both a, a policy agenda and a legislative agenda there to think about how do we um, minimize our own vulner vulnerabilities just in terms of the way our own organizations, our institutions are, are currently constructed. Wondered if you'd had any, any Well, I'll check that, that book out. You know, it, that kind of gets back to this to whole thing yeah. of how do we, you know, we, we have uh, laws governing horse and buggy in an era of the automobile that we need to do something about. And, you know, Congress is a lagging indicator if there ever was one. I mean, you know, <laughs> as politics generally in a democracy is. The people have the ideas first. They elect the kind of people. Unfortunately, right now, they've elected some that reflect frustrations about globalization that we need to work through a little bit. But so I think there's got to be a legislative and an executive response to some of these changes that we're seeing happen. Congressman, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, this is clearly a critical issue that we will be wrestling with in the years to come. Uh, appreciate your, your leadership on this, the bipartisan spirit that you're bringing to these tough problems um, that are absolutely critical for moving us forward. So Nancy, please. Thank you very much. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. All of our major foreign policy victories have been bipartisan and based on the fundamental values of our country and the, really the 
Judeo-Christian ethic of you know, that. And so hopefully we can get back to that. And I really appreciate the chance to be here. I love these things that you set up, these bipartisan forums. And the more we can talk that way, the better we can defuse our own internal conflict down on the hill, okay? This partisanship that threatens to rip everybody apart. And in the 24-hour news cycle, everybody's got to say a bunch of mean things about the Democrats, and Democrats have say a bunch of mean things about Republicans, and the people are sitting back in Milwaukee saying, what's going on in my country? Well, we, they deserve being, better. Thank you for being a beacon of how it can be and, and for all that you're doing to make it a more bipartisan spirit. So well, please you. join me in appreciating thank and you. thanking Congressman Thank you very much.